Thank you, Father, for um, discussing your word. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity to share the wisdom that's within your language. Father, I ask that you be with me, help me to share your truth, and also be with the people listening so they can receive what you want to teach them. And I ask that you speak into our hearts. In the mighty name of Yeshua Mashiach. Amen. All right, so tonight uh, we're going to continue with the Aleph Bet. And um, we've done the Aleph and the Bet for the second time around. And because of the poor quality of the previous videos, I've decided to continue. And I think I need to go up to the letter H to redo them. Um, so we currently redoing the third letter of the Aleph Bet, which is the Gimel. Um, so, and because my curiosity, um, I can't help myself than to scratch beneath the surface, not only redoing last year's um, teaching on the Gimel, but I found a few interesting things um, that I want to share, rather than just recapturing what we already done. Um, so just to recap from last time, just a quick review. Um, so we looked at where the uh, letter Gimel is first found in scripture, and that was in the storyline of Abram and Sarah, where Abram received gifts when the king took Sarah um, to be his wife. And those gifts, uh, one of those gifts was a camel, and that's where the word camel or gamal or gimel um, was first found in scripture. And each one of those um, gifts was basically giving us some insight to the gifts of um, the, the gifts to the bride, which prepare her um, to come before the king. Um, and then there was also um, a bit more in depth around the number three and the gematria of the number three. And that eventually led to a few scriptures in Daniel where we discussed um, the different um, kinds of prayer. So the Gimel is associated with prayer as well. So I'm not going to do anything uh, regarding those topics. So we're going to look at the like, Gimel from the perspective of creation. Uh, we laid a lot of foundation last week on creation. And I want to uh, continue with that. So we're going to have a short recap on the letter bet. Then we're going to look at the letter Gimel and all its symbolism. And then we're going to try and answer the question, what happened between Genesis 1 verse 1 and Genesis 1 verse 2? Now, this has been a topic in the last two weeks um, around Facebook and, and the internet. Um, little did I know that I'm going to stumble upon it as myself. Um, and there's some insights regarding the Gimel that I discovered that might help us to answer that question. So we're going to look at that. Then there's a few meanings regarding the letter Gimel, which we didn't touch on last time when we did the study. Um, then we can look at the concept of the spoil of the nations, which is associated with the camel and how it relates to the nations and the house of Yahweh. Um, then we're going to look at the construction of the letter Gimel, which is basically constructed by connecting a letter Vav and the letter Yod to make up the, the, the letter Gimel and also the gematria of the Vav and the Yod, which is 16, and what that relates to. Then the letter Gimel being the number three as well. And number three is uh, connected to the covenant, and it's also linked to creation, specifically the third verse in Genesis 1. So we're going to look at that as well. Then we're going to look at the concept of the uh, hand of Yahweh, the, the hidden hand of Yahweh, which is depicted by the letter Yod, and where the Gimel is one of the attributes of the Spirit, and we previously discovered or discussed the, the other two meanings of the Spirit, which is depicted by the letter He and the letter Shin. So we're going to look at the third attribute of Yahweh's Spirit, which is um, the symbolism of the letter Gimel in relation to the unseen hand of Yahweh, which is the letter Yod. And then we're going to look at creation and another view or another spin on creation. Just putting some thoughts down. It's, it's, it's my opinion. I extrapolated some ideas based on Genesis 1 verse 1 and 1 verse 2. 
and came up with a few other concepts that might be plausible. And they're all associated and linked to the letter Gimel. And that's basically flowing uh, right into the letter He and the letter Shin. And the combination of the three, revealing of Yahweh's hand and the power of his hand within creation. So it's going to be a, a interesting teaching uh, specifically regarding creation and taking off from the previous study on the letter Bet, which uh, depicted the house and um, the house of creation. So just to quickly recap, so we looked at the first verse, Genesis 1 verse 1. So we had Bereshit bara Elohim et hashamayim ve'et ha'eret. And that means uh, in the beginning, uh, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. Now the first statement I just want to make here is that we see that Elohim created in the first verse. Now, I've been um, studying uh, Genesis 2 as well. Now, in Genesis 2, it not only mentioned Elohim, but it mentions Yahweh Elohim. And that is used 20 times in Genesis chapter 2, the combination of Yahweh Elohim, in comparison to Genesis 1, where only Elohim is used. Now, the, the name of, of Yahweh, Yote Vafe, is the name of grace. And the name Elohim is the name of righteousness. Now, the righteousness is the strict righteousness of being right or wrong, black and white, one and zero. So it's very precise in the concept of creation. And you can compare the name of Elohim to science, how exact science should be in order to sustain life. So there's no room for error. Um, where in Genesis 2, it talks about the creation of man. And how Adam was formed and how Chava was taken from Adam and um, how humans came to being. And Yahweh Elohim is used in that extent. And Yahweh being the name um, uh, that, depicted, that depicts grace, uh, give us the idea that grace had to be added in order to create man. Now, the reason for that is, is that Yahweh created man to have free will. And man had to have free will in order to have a choice, in order to love out of free will. And because there's free will, there's now more room for error, and he had to allow a bit more tolerance, if you like. And that's why Yahweh Elohim was in combination used in the creation of man. And the Yahweh concept adding grace is now um, taking up the slack of the error through the addition of the work of Mashiach, where he will take up the slack or the tolerances or the error or room for error that is required for man to be to exist in this in this uh, space where they stimulate the concept of free will and to develop in that environment. So that's just something interesting and that I discovered this week as well. So verse one is about Elohim. Strict righteousness, no room for error. And that is where the first verse um, basically give us the, the, the whole summary of creation. The time frame in the beginning or where everything began. And what we discovered with in the beginning is the word Bereshit. And Bereshit is basically the first act prior to anything that happened. Bereshit is that first um, act or, or, or deed that had to happen prior to the creation of anything. So Bereshit um, is basically the concept of an artist um, getting ready to start his work. So he's getting the paint, he's getting the canvas, he's thinking about the idea, what he wants to paint, what he wants to portray, what he want the viewer um, to experience when he look at that work of art. So before putting the first stroke of paint on the canvas, getting everything ready, that's what Bereshit is about. It's about the planning process, the preparation process, getting everything into place. And then the next word is bara, which is create. So after that preparation, he started to create. And the first thing that he created was, let there be light. That's verse three. So we're gonna spend more time just discovering uh, uh, the verse three that is linked to the number three, that's linked to the, the letter Gimel. Um, also, I would just like to um, recap on Bereshit, 
which starts with the letter bet. And that letter bet is the space in which everything is created. Now, that letter bet also depicts the world of duality. The world of duality is the physical realm where we get the opposing forces like hot and cold, light and darkness, uh, good and evil, everything that create two opposites where energy or um, uh, 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 life can exist within. So without the poles of duality, life cannot exist. So he created this, this space that support duality for humans and life to exist within. And that's also found within the concept of Bereshit. So that's just a, a bit of a recap on, on last, last time's teaching. So the creation, uh, the connection to creation um, in relation to the letter Gimel, we, we are going to attempt to answer the question, what happened between Genesis 1 verse 1 and Genesis 1 verse 2? Now Genesis 1 verse 1 gives us the full extent of the creation in the beginning and we him created the heavens and the earth. It gives us the idea that everything is now perfect. Then verse 2, it talks about that everything is dark, without form, without void, and the spirit of Yahweh was moving over the waters of the deep, and there was darkness. And then verse 3 says, let there be light. So something happened between verse 1 and verse 2 to, to take the fullness of the creation to a lower state, which is basically a state of uh, emptiness and voidness. Now the link to um, the Gimel um, is found within the construction of the Gimel and the, the, the number of that uh, two letters that construct the Gimel, which is the Vav and the Yod. Now Vav is the number six and Yod is number 10. So that gives us the number 16. And when we look at words that also added to number 16, they are supporting the idea of the Gimel. So the one of the words that support this whole idea of creation that we find in verse 2 is the word hava that is hey vav hey and that means desire calamity iniquity naughtiness or naught, uh, naughtiness which has to do with something that turns to naught or nothing nothingness and ruin so that is describing the same state um, that existed in genesis 1 verse 2 and that is connected to the letter gimel now, there's a positive meaning to this word, which is desire, and then it's a negative meaning to this word, which is ruin and naught, or naughtiness. And that is also connected to the two words that it's describing that state, which is tohu and bohu, which is empty and void, and uh, nothingness. So what we see here is that there is now an, a void or an emptiness that draws out the creative power of Yahweh, where he has a desire to fill those, those, those voids or to fill that naughtiness or that ruin with something of substance. And that let the energy flow and that spark of creation then um, uh, go on to, into verse 3, where he said, and let there be light. So that's the first attempt to fill this void. And that is all related to the letter Gimel. So Yahweh has the desire to restore things back to its formal glory as described in Genesis 1 verse 1 through all the, the, the aspects and all the mechanisms that's associated with the number 16 to change Hava into something which is according to his desire, which is also another way to say that is according to Yahweh's will. So his will um, is basically filling every void in order to fill it with himself. Now, the reason I'm saying that, you will note that Hava is Hey Vav Hey. The only thing missing to create the name Yote Vav Hey is the letter Yod. And we're going to look in a bit more detail um, into that to see how Yahweh fills the void with the spark of creation, the Yod, to represent Yote Vav Hey, which is basically another way to express himself within his creation. Now, the, trying to answer the question, what happened between the two verses, uh, Genesis 1 verse 1 and 1 verse 2, um, in saying that, trying to attempt to explain this, we need to understand that um, Hebrew is cyclical, specifically around time. So time is not linear, it's not, it doesn't have a beginning and an end, because the beginning and the end is actually the same point. 
and it just continues cycles and those cycles repeat. So from Yahweh's point of view, he's above time. These cycles does not um, uh, matter from his point of view because it's a repeating cycle or a refinement cycle that takes place. So with that in mind, we can say that Genesis 1 verse 1 to Genesis 1 verse 2 is one of these cycles of creating and recreating or refining his creation. So it's like someone um, who creates something, they prototype it, and then they refine it, and they improve on it, and then there's another design cycle and another recreation cycle in order to make it perfect. So we don't know how many cycles there were, and we are part of this current cycle that is explained and, and written down in the scripture in Genesis 1 verse 1 and 1 verse 2. So that's just an, another idea or another look at creation from that point of view. Now, other words that also link up to number 16 that's associated with um, the Gimel, um, specifically underline the attributes of Mashiach um, and what, what the meanings are specifically, I don't have the Hebrew here, but the English uh, meaning of those words are precious stone. We know that he is the rock, he's the corner stone. And that make him a precious stone on which the foundation is built um, to make guilty, to make someone guilty. He carried our guilt upon himself. Then we have slaughter. He was our sacrifice. Then we have the idea of to pass over. Um, that has to do with death passing us over through redemption of his blood. Then spoil. That has to do with the reward of the work that he's done. So we're going to look at that word a bit later on what that means, then the word mighty come up. And that's also one of the meanings of the word Gimel. It's associated with the strength that is within our spirit. And we receive that strength by engaging with the spirit. And then the other word is to be alert or to be uh, cautious against um, specifically dark forces or the enemy. And then lastly, desire, which is this word Hava, which has to do with Yahweh's will. So all those aspects and concepts also encapsulate the work of Mashiach. So basically we can say that the work of the Gimel is the expression of the work of the Messiah, specifically his redemption work and the salvation work through his sacrifice and which he'd done. And also the laying down of the precious stone or the foundation, which is the building of this house, which take us back to the letter bet. And we're going to see the relation between the Gimel and the bet and what that means in a couple of a minute. So um, the next uh, slide is just showing us the different ways the Gimel is written. So we have the pictograph and then we have the, uh, the normal um, Hebrew, modern Hebrew um, depiction of the letter Gimel, which is basically the, the, the idea of the Vav and the Yod that make up that Gimel. And the gematria or the number of the Gimel that it represents is number three because it's the third letter. You'll see from the letter Aleph, coming from right to left, um, we have Aleph, Bet, and the third letter is Gimel. So we're going to look at the combination of those two letters and what work that make, makes and what that means. But before we do that, um, let's just explore a bit more around the, the function of the Gimel expressed as a camel. Now, camel is the word Gamal that is similarly written as Gimel, which is, are the letters Gimel, Mem, Lamet. And the camel, if you think about a camel, it's an animal that can transport or carry a load in a very difficult environment or situation. Even against all odds, that uh, function will um, uh, be done. And that is associated with Yahweh's desire or Yahweh's will. His will will always be done. There's nothing that will stop that. He will find a way where there is no way, even if you're not available, he will use someone else in order for his will to be expressed in this world and his plan to be fulfilled within um, uh, your time frame. So that gimel gives us the idea of Yahweh's strength, his will, and the ability to fulfill whatever needs to be done, even if it looks impossible. And that's basically what the, the, the function or the, 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 the image of the, the camel represents. So the, the Gimel then uh, basically uh, represent the strength of Yahweh and the strong desire and his strong will that will be fulfilled 
uh, regardless any situation or any environment that you need to face. And it also gives us the idea of endurance, specifically inner strength that we will receive from his spirit. So when we receive his spirit, he strengthens us on, on the inside so that we can walk in his ways and express his will in our lives. So that is um, the function of the gimel through the work of the spirits within our lives. Now the gimel being the third letter, as I said, is associated with the third verse, which is Genesis 1 verse 3, which start with the words, let there be light. Now the light, we discussed this previously when we looked at the letter iron, where the iron is the fountain of light or uh, the eye, where the idea of or, which is the light that, that eliminates from Yahweh, um, is translated through the lens of the iron into the physical. And it basically allows the light to be a lower light, which we know as photons. Now, science discovered that photons are the basic building blocks of the physical or any matter for that, for that matter. And therefore, let there be light is the initial act of laying down the foundation and building blocks of anything that is constructed in the physical realm. So it's like the first brush stroke, the first thing that had to happen before anything else can happen because everything is built from this foundation of light. And that foundation of light is associated with the work of the Gimel and what the Gimel represents. So we see that the Gimel is very significant in its purpose of uh, making creation possible. It's like the vehicle of carrying all the power and all the ideas and all the plans into existence, expressing Yahweh's desire and his will through the function and the mechanisms uh, the, uh, contained within the letter Gimel. So we're going to touch on a few of those just to get an idea of what that means in relation to creation. So this idea of light also provides the concept and the idea of truth because light is also truth and truth is linked to the letter He and truth is basically related to commandments. So when Yahweh said, let there be light, he's actually expressing a commandment and he's commanding light to exist. So his word and his commandments transfer his idea in his mind and his desire through the medium of words, expressing it in the form of a commandment, through the means and the mechanisms that carry it into the physical through the vehicle of the gimel. And that then has the result of creating all that light to exist, to manifest the will of Yahweh through the, the, the function of the gimel, gimel. So light is also an energy that contain energy. So light carries heat as well. Light also carry all the spectrum of all the colors. So everything that we see and perceive is possible through light. So light is, is also associated with, with energy, with, with the flowing of electrons, with the, with the firing of our neurons and our perception of consciousness and our existence. Everything is associated with that initial spark of creation which is light, which is associated with the gimel. So I'm just trying to labor this, this point through for you to understand the importance of the gimel. Without the gimel, um, the creation could not happen. It's the vehicle of carrying the will of the Father through the medium of words into existence, expressing it through the medium of light and words. And, um, and, and, and that forms the building block of all the elements, of all the physical uh, building blocks within nature and the physical as well as the spiritual realm. So it's fairly significant. Various meanings of, of the Gimel, just giving us a, a bit of a, a few different views on the Gimel that confirm and just um, uh, uh, strengthen the idea of what I just explained. So the, the, the camel gives us the idea of movement and progress, carrying a load or the ability to do work, um, moving something from one point to another. So looking at the construction of the gimel, the vav and the yod, if we look at the picture of the orange vav and the purple yod, it looks like a, a, a foot and vav of course is man, number six, 
And it's, it seems like a man walking towards the left. And we know that the Yod is also the invisible hand of Yahweh. So that means that man's feet is directed by the unseen hand of Yahweh, which is his spirit walking in the physical. And that's just a beautiful picture of um, we that need his guidance in order to walk so that we will not stumble and fall. And not stumbling means that we do not sin and we walk in holiness. So that's just an a, a interesting picture, also depicted by the letter Gimel. Now, Gimel also means to, to treat a person well or to treat a person ill. So we have the, the concept of duality again, uh, good and evil, um, doing good or doing evil towards someone. And the Gimel is the function of doing either. So the Gimel is neutral but it's got the, the, the means to perform the act of doing something good or the means to perform the act of doing something evil. So this implies also giving as well as withdrawing or giving and taking. And that's, that's also the idea that is within uh, the Gimel. And that's also confirming moving and returning, moving towards something and returning from something. And all of those ideas have to do with the cycles that exist within nature, the cycles that exist within our bodies, and that things need to be carried from one place to another in order to sustain life. Now, examples of that is found within humans. For example, the flowing of blood, carrying oxygen, breathing, um, inhaling oxygen, exhaling carbon dioxide, um, the movement of the lungs in and out, and also in nature, the cycles and all the cycles within animals and insects and plants, everything has to do with transferring something from one place to another and uh, transferring life from one point to another. We also see that in, in, in the sun, moon and stars and the movement of those um, uh, bodies in the sky and all those aspects of movement, going to and fro, going around, going around in circles, breathing in and out, transferring something from some place to another, all of that has to do with the letter Gimel. So every energy that flow to perform a function of work in the physical as well as in the spiritual is represented by the processes associated with the letter Gimel. So I've got a little picture there of a man thinking and then the uh, nervous system give the muscle the information to move the arm to point at something. So all of those movements, even the thoughts, all of that is encapsulated within the meaning of the gimel. So the gimel make us function, the gimel make nature function, and the gimel make the, the cosmos and the universe function, if you like. It's, it's, it's the movement and um, the transferring of energies um, that is encapsulated by the, the meaning of the Gimel. So uh, the next slide, I want to emphasize uh, the concept of Yote Vafe in relation to creation. Now we know when Yahweh created, he created everything from himself. Now he is expressed in his higher form or highest form to us. When we look at him from the physical, we see Yote Vafe. Some people believe not even to try and pronounce his name. Um, some people say Yahweh or Yahuwah or however or Jehovah, how they want to express it. That is our attempt to comprehend him in his holiest form or his most full form or the most expressive form that we can perceive. That's the name Yote Vave. Now in this slide, I'm trying to convey the idea that the fullness of creation and everything he created in the physical and spiritual, if you take all those ideas together and you can comprehend all of them at once, that is yot vafe And he expresses himself through everything he created, even us, and, and everything that consists within the spiritual and physical realm that we can perceive from our point of view. That is Yote Vafe. Now the idea comes from that word Hava, that is linked to number 16, that's linked to the, to the uh, letter Gimel, that has to do with Yahweh's desire to fill something that is empty. Now the Jews believe uh, when Yahweh created, he created a void within himself. And that's the word Hava. 
and then he's shown uh, shown light within that void and from that light that's verse three let there be light everything was created within him and everything comes from him to fill the void that we currently know as creation that extends beyond our physical into the spiritual into the multiple realms of the spiritual heavens and uh, things that's mentioned in scripture so all of that is contained within him through that initial spark of light and all of that equals yot so that word hava as you can see the majority of his name is contained within that word hava and the positive part of that is his desire and his will all his plans everything he'd done in the process of bereshit preparing everything is now being expressed to fill that empty void that he created within himself which is described in verse uh, James 1 verse 2 as tohu and bohu which is emptiness and ruin or voidness to fill that with himself now he had to remove everything in order to only express the pureness of himself within that void he created and that spark that created everything is depicted by the letter yod which is added to hava to create the fullness of yote vave that we know as yahweh and when we study creation we've got the best chance of studying him who he is that's why science is good that's why studying nature is good that's why studying the spiritual and everything regarding the spiritual is good studying the scripture is good everything that is given to us in this life in this realm is useful for us to try and comprehend him but in saying that Yahweh is greater than his name Yote Vafe Yote Vafe is only a physical representation of who he is towards us into the physical when we stand on the other side of Yote Vafe he is much greater than that and we can't comprehend him that's why we need to be renewed in order to comprehend we need an upgrade in our intelligence in order to understand him. So from our current limited point of view, Yote Vafe is the ultimate understanding of his fullness with our limitation and our limited understanding of him. So there's more beyond Yote Vafe. He's greater than that. So that's just a, a, a thought I had just meditating on, on these ideas. So the link I want to make is that Hava, which is linked to the Gimel, is also linked to Genesis 1 verse 2, which is Tohu and Bohu. Now when you read verse 1, it basically gives us the whole idea of Yote Vafa, everything that's created perfect. And as uh, 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 an example, in order to take the Yote Vafa state, which is verse 1, to a lower state, he removed the yod from his creation, that spark, and it all went down to a lower state of hava, which is ruin or emptiness or something that is void. So it's existing. It's like a car without a battery. It's fully functional, but it doesn't have the energy or the potential energy to make it work. And you have to put the spark back in order to switch on everything within that 100% fully built, created uh, vehicle in order to switch everything on. So that's the other view I'm going to uh, take on creation at the end of the study, just stimulating your ideas and thought processes around that idea of Yahweh creating everything, removing his hand, and then during the six days, switching things back on testing them refining them so to speak in order to come up with a six-day creation of perfection like we know know it as it is today so that's just a bit of a jump into the end of the study so genesis 1 verse 1 was it just a mere heading stating the obvious he created the heavens and the earth and then he started with verse 2 and then verse 3 or is it like I just explained? Might it be that he created everything, removed himself from it, and then slowly switched it back on through the six stages of the six periods of time, which is the six days of creation? But the key I want to emphasize is the spark of creation, which is the letter Yod, that is removed 
and it becomes Hava, which is a ruin, or empty or void. And when you put back the Yod, it becomes Yahweh, or the fullness of his creation, switching everything back on. And um, we're going to apply that to us as humans as well. Um, the other thing I want to just um, go back on in the, in the image on the top left, or, or the top right, is the previous discussion when we had the Aleph. Uh, we made up the Aleph with a Vav and two Yods. And the Vav is whatever is created, the number six or the six days of creation. And the two Yods are the two hands of the Creator forming every uh, Vav um, that make up uh, this world. So those two yodes were placeholders for the hands that is expressed by the two functions of his spirit, which is the hay and the shin. You know, the hay is the truth, the word, the spoken word or the commandments that spoke everything into existence. And the shin is the power that separates things, separates the water from the water, the water from the land, and all those things. Now, what I want to emphasize here is the letter yod also contain the letter gimel which is the third part of the function of the spirit that is required for the completeness of the yod to be the spark of creation. So the spark of creation does not only consist of the two, the, uh, the hay and the shin, but it also includes the gimel. And those three are the powers of the spirit that has the ability to switch on his creation, to change the ruin into something that is his will and his desire which is the fullness of Yote Vafa expressed in his creation. All right, so attributes of the spirit um, depicted by the letter Yod. So the Yod is the unseen hand of Yahweh, and we also discussed that previously. It's the helping hand of Yahweh. Now, Yahweh can help you in multiple ways. How does he help us? The first way he helps us is through the letter Hey, which is light, truth, it's also the sound of breath, which is the Holy Spirit. And that function allow us to have a new nature. So he's helping us to change the old nature into a new nature. The second way is, his hand is helping us is through the letter Shin, which is the fire, which is depicted on Pentecost, the fire coming down. It has to do with the authority, the anointing, and the abilities or capabilities, which we also know as um, the gifts of the spirit, which allow us to function within the body, um, manifesting some of the attributes of the Mashiach, so that collectively we represent him as a whole. So those two has to do with us. The first one gives us a new nature, which is the fruit of the spirit. The second one is about the abilities or the anointing, which are the gifts of the spirit. Now the third one is the gimel, which is that inner strength to help us to carry us through difficult situations and specifically to let Yahweh's will be done through our lives, performing work for his benefit within the kingdom. So that those are the three attributes of the spirit that is collectively represented by the letter Yod and specifically working within us in, in, in this um, uh, point of view. So um, Genesis 1 verse 3, as I said, um, that was the start of the creation process. Let there be light. And that light is basically the spark of the creation, which is the letter Yod, that released the power of the Hay, the Shin, and the Gimel within the uh, creation. Uh, and the same parallel can be drawn within man when Yahweh made man they fell and they lost the yod the hand of Yahweh and now he had to restore his spirit and the three attributes of his spirit within us in order to create the Adam the perfect Adam, Adam in us again and we need all three aspects of his spirit in our lives in order to switch on or recreate us to that higher form which is according to his will and his desire. So the spoil of the nations, this is where we look at the combination of the two letters, the two consecutive letters, Bet Gimel, make the word Bag, um, which means side, uh, uh, specifically backside, uh, reward and spoil. 
It has to do with carrying a load on the back of the camel in this case. And this word bet gibel or bag is first used in Ezekiel 25 7, where it talks about Yahweh stretching out his hand against Ammon. So you can get a hint about the hand of Yahweh and Ammon. So who is who was Ammon? If you analyze the word Ammon, it consists of two parts. The first part is Am, which is Ein Mem, which means people or nations. And then we have the Vav and the Nun Sufi. Now, previously we discussed those two letters. The Vav means man, it's number six. And the Nun Sufi is the extended Nun when it's at the end of the word that looks like an enlarged Vav. And that depicts a mature Vav or crowned Vav. And that is the elevated state of man, someone who received the hay and the shin transformation, the abilities and the anointing and the new nature. So what Yahweh is doing, he's extending his hand into Ammon, into the nations, in order to transform the Vav into a Nun Sufit, making man that's in a fallen state back to the restored state. Now what's also interesting is that the gimel or the camel is connected to the bed or the house. So that means that the camel is carrying the nations back into the house. And within this verse in Ezekiel 25, 7, it talks about the spoil that is received. That word spoil is, is uh, uh, gad. Oh, oh, sorry, bag, not gad. Um, the spoil of the hidden or the spoil of the nations, which is taken back. So it's basically saying indirectly that the nations are the reward of Yahweh. And when we read Genesis 15, it talks about when Yahweh made the covenant with Abraham, he said, I am your exceedingly great reward. Now in this verse, it's basically the nations are Yahweh's exceedingly great reward. So we get him and he gets us. And that's the concept of the covenant, which is also seen in the marriage covenant. Um, when two people marry, you give your hand to uh, uh, your wife or your husband, and you now fully uh, give yourself, and you are her reward, and she is your reward. It's the same exchange that takes place. So the language that we read here is the language of marriage. And we can look at that specifically in relation to the number three and the covenant and how that relates to the marriage covenant. So the nations will have to make a spiritual journey through the wilderness. So that's the carrying of the load through the wilderness depicted by the camel. And the storyline is depicted in the pattern of leaving Egypt and traveling through the wilderness on your way to the promised land. So it's going from one place to another, which is the function of the gimel, carrying something from one place place to another and we need the strength of the gimel to carry us through and israel needed the strength of the gimel or yahweh spirit in order to carry them right from egypt into the promised land so we see the same parallels what's also interesting is that the covenant that was made with abraham uh, allowed this inheritance to take place and that covenant is extended through the mashiach yeshua to the nations as well. So first of all, it was extended to Israel, and later on it was extended to the nations. So this stretched out hand that stretched out against Ammon is basically restoring the Yod back into Hava, giving that spark of life back into the nations, similar to the creation process. So this creation process, um, that spark of life is also required for the nations or for man because we are a created being and that spark or that yoke um, is depicted by the hay the shin and the gimel the three attributes of his spirit that we need in order to um, change the little vav to a nunsafit or the crown vav or to an anointed elevated state now the covenant or the number three um, is depicted or linked to the gimel um, being the third letter as well and number three means covenant. So the first covenant that was cut that we read in scripture is with Abraham in Genesis 15. And there we read that Abraham was, uh, he split the animals in half, placed them opposite each other. And then he went into a deep sleep. Yahweh put him in a deep sleep 
and then the torch or the furnace walked in, in amongst the animals. And Yahweh basically um, cut the covenant with himself on behalf of man. So whenever the covenant is broken, he has to pay the price in order to uh, still fulfill the requirements of the covenant. So it's on behalf of man that he did it, did it. So that's why Yeshua had to die because man broke the covenant and he um, did the covenant with himself. So he had to step up and take the consequence of man's sin upon himself. And that's the reason why Abraham's covenant is linked to Yeshua's death. Now what we see here is another link. And that's found within the word deep sleep, which is uh, tardema. Um, and that word is also found in Genesis 2 verse 21, where Adam was placed into a deep sleep. And when that happened, Yahweh removed his, from his side, which word telah, which means half, and he removed the woman or chava from him. And from that point on, Adam was called ish or man, and woman was called isha. Now, I've got the two words, um, Isha, there. So you'll see it's Aleph, Shin, Hey. And Ish is uh, Aleph, Yod, Shin. Now, when you combine these two in the form of marriage, you'll see that um, the, the, the Aleph and the Shin are found in both. They have that in common. The only uh, two letters that are different to man and woman is the Yod and the Hey. And when you combine those two together, you get, double the ish or man and you get yot hey which is a short form of yot hey vafe or yahweh so we see that the fulfillment of reuniting isha and ish the man and the woman we get yahweh so the fullness of yahweh is expressed through the marriage covenant within a male and a female and um, the marriage commitment so that's a beautiful picture of the covenant. And it's related to Abraham because the animals were split. And in, in the case of Adam, he was split or separated. And the deep sleep is the other connection um, uh, that links the two. Now, if you want to understand Abraham's covenant, you have to look back at Genesis 2 verse 21 and read the backdrop of the story of Adam because the covenant is basically the marriage covenant. And we read about that in the end, uh, in the New Testament, in Revelation, about the marriage between the bride and the groom, or the bride of Messiah and uh, Yeshua the Messiah, where there will be a marriage feast, or where the reuniting of Ish and Isha will take place, where Yahweh will reunite with man um, in, in, in the last... Um, uh, uh, in, uh, intent of his will, um, which is after the second coming. So the covenant made with Abraham is also the covenant made with Adam and the covenant made through Mashiach. Now, Adam extended the covenant to humanity. Abraham extended the covenant to Israel and Mashiach extended the covenant to all the nations. That's why Amon um, um, is the picture of the nations coming in and that is the work of Messiah uh, through the anointed people um, which are his followers that do work within the nations in order to bring them into covenant with him uh, so that they can be part of the bride. So the key of the covenant in order to establish this covenant is the hand of Yahweh, that spark of creation, the yod. Um, that is required to place that back into the nations and do the work of the Spirit. Now, the work of the Spirit is depicted by the word um, gamal or camel, which is uh, also the word gimel, which is gimel uh, mem lamet, which are placed on the menorah pattern. So if, when we look at these three words on the menorah pattern, it will give us a bit more insight into the work of the Spirit that is extending the hand within the nations. So first of all, the gimel, let the gimel is on the right, so that means spiritual, so that's the goal, the intent. And as we already discovered, the gimel is the means of carrying people back into the house, carrying the arm or the nations, 
back into the house of father of the father in order to meet him and that's the main function of the gimel or the outcome of the, the, the function of, of the, the camel or the gimel in the middle is the letter mem now like we all always explain is that the letter mem is in the center that upholds everything so that's the core function of this word or the most important part of this word and the letter mem depicts the word the word of Yahweh specifically. So basically what this tells us is that the function of carrying the nations back to the Father can only be made possible through the word of Yahweh. So if the nations do not receive the word, they cannot return to the house. So it's crucial that the word goes out and that people share the word of Yahweh to the nations. That's why Yeshua gave that um, uh, command to his disciples now the last letter is the lamet now the lamet's on the left or in the physical and that's the shepherd's staff it's also the meaning of teaching and learning so if you receive the word and you do nothing with it it will not benefit you and you will not be carried back to the father into his house you need to apply the word and the teaching in order to apply to your life to have the benefit of the word and then you have the benefit of the gimel carrying you back into the house so those um, aspects are very logical to us to understand the gospel message but it's also depicted in the meaning of the gimel and what that represents and how that relates to the word the understanding and the application of the word and what the end goal is for applying his word to our lives and who it applies to it's all the nations it's not only for the jews it's not only for christians it's for everybody everybody's welcome to go back to yahweh um, and we are playing part into that process by reaching out to the nations um the next slide is about the covenant in relation to the bride so the marriage covenant between ish and isha is to take man that exists in the world of duality back to the realm of unity where echad is where we will be one with the father where we will be one uh, with him so the idea of the marriage is not the new testament idea and um, that is found in Isaiah 61 verse 10 where it says i will greatly rejoice in yahweh my soul shall be joyful in my elohim for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation he has covered me with the rope of righteousness as a bridegroom covers himself with ornaments and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels so we see that the bride and the groom are prepared by the coverings or the clothes or the garments which are depicted by salvation and righteousness now the storyline that give us the idea of what salvation is about is um, Noah. Noah was perfect in his generation. So he was a righteous man and he received salvation. And those who were part of his family came in with him into the ark. And the ark's a picture of the work of Messiah. And they were saved from destruction or the cleansing of the earth, which is depicted between Genesis 1 verse 1 and 1 verse 2. So that cycle of cleansing, after that cleansing, that's Genesis 1 verse 2. Everything is dark and void and empty. Uh, but Noah survived that. And that let there be light was when Ararat, uh, when, when, when his ark landed on Ararat and everything had a new start or a new cycle began. So we can also see the same picture of the cycles of creation within uh, Noah. And it's also the language of the wedding or the, the wedding between the bride and the groom, which is depicted by the, the, the bride of Messiah and Yeshua, the Messiah and the marriage covenant. So the covenant and the premise of the covenant is always about marriage. It's all, always about reuniting man back to Yahweh and using the mechanisms of the Gimel, everything that the Gimel is about, in order to carry the nations back to the house of the father in order to reunite them with him that's the intent of the covenant 
And salvation is describing that whole process. You are saved from a fallen state and brought back into a restored state of a bride. And that process we call the preparation of the bride, which has to do with righteousness and holiness, which is a garment you clothe yourself with. And when you are clothed with the, with the garment, you are ready to be married. If the bride doesn't have the garment on, she's not adorned herself, um, she will uh, not be part of the, the wedding party and she will uh, not be part of the wedding. So the key is the preparation, and we read about that in the book of Esther. So the marriage covenant is about the concept of salvation. That's why Yeshua's work is about the wedding. It's about setting everything into place so that righteousness can exist for those who have faith in him so they can be redeemed and prepare themselves as a bride and accessing the Lamed, the learning and the teaching and his word and the strength of his spirit in order to be carried back to the house. So all of that, and the function of this covenant is made possible through the strength of the Gimel and the spirit working. And we see the same storyline within Isaac, where he sent his servant to go and get his bride. And the servant is the, the basically the picture of the Gimel going out and bringing back the bride to Isaac, which is a picture of the Messiah. So we see the same pattern over and over again, confirming the same thing. Um, the next slide is just about giving a bit more backdrop on the gematria of uh, the, the letters uh, Gimel Mem Lamet. So if you add up those three letters, it add up to number 73. So this just gives us a bit of a different look at the Gimel and what that can mean and highlighting a few other uh, point of views, um, strengthening um, some of these ideas. So the first word, I'm not going to read all the Hebrew, I'm just going to go to the, the English. The first word is about Yahweh hears. It's about uh, the father listening to his people. His intent and his desire is to save us, to restore us back to him. And therefore, he's a father that cares and a father that listens to his children. The next word is whom Yahweh enlightens. It's all about the restoration process. Enlightenment has to do with uh, Chochmah Bina Da'at. It's about wisdom and understanding having that spiritual understanding in order to understand what things are about so that you can be part of that and want to be restored and want to work with the spirit in order to go back to the father. The next word is chokhmah, which is wisdom, which is basically the white space between the black letters. Everything that is not written down is basically chokhmah. And when you connect the letters, you connect the words, you connect the verses or the ideas or the stories or everything in nature, Everything that pops up from connecting all those ideas are basically the unwritten wisdom. And it's the wisdom that is timeless without culture that can be applied to any culture within any time frame. So wisdom is what is required that needs to be extracted from the word, that needs to be extracted from Yahweh's creation, from his nature, so that we can apply his will and his ways within our lives. And we need to learn that wisdom, that chokhmah. And that's why we study his word. Uh, the next word is to ask, to seek, or to desire. And that's the desire to learn and the desire to know him and the desire to learn his wisdom in order to be enlightened, in order to be restored and to be elevated back to the Father. Uh, the next word is to do, has to do with the circle or rotating door. That's the cycles or the function of the gimel, putting everything into action, moving something from one place to another or moving it within a cycle, refining it. It's all about the restoration process associated with the gimel. The next one is to flee, to seek refuge and refuge. That has to do with righteousness and salvation. It's to steer away from the things that will draw us away from the will of the Father and seek refuge against those things which uh, also to do with the consequences uh, for unrighteousness, which associates with the curses. 
Um, the next one is to grind and grinding mill. That's part of the refining process, which Yahweh Spirit take us through. Specifically, the letter Shin, which has to do with fire, refining fire, purifying silver, adding heat to your life, difficult situations, things we need to face. And those things will help us to get closer to Him. So it's not always bad if a bad thing happens to good people. It's part of the refining process. The last one is sickle. That has to do with the reaping the harvest. It has to do with that final salvation. It has to do with entering the house, uh, returning back to the Father, where the Father will gather his reward and taking them back to him. So all these meanings support the function of the given that we already discussed. And it just gives us a bit more insight and a, a bit more color or definition into those ideas. Um, the next uh, slide is about cause and effect. As I said, the gimbal is neutral. It just fulfills a function, whether it's positive or negative. But the idea of the gimbal being the mechanism within nature specifically gives us the concept of if you disturb the balance, there's a consequence that will want to restore the balance. Now, the consequence of actions are also known from a spiritual point of view as curses. So when we disrupt the spiritual realm by influencing it in a negative way through doing sin or doing something evil, releasing Hava into Yahweh's creation, that will automatically want to restore itself. That desire to come back to its uh, uh, balanced form will shift back and that will be if that effect will be perceived by yourself as a curse or a negative consequence of your actions so that is built in within the mechanisms of the gimel that will just try to get the balance straight so i've got this little picture of the dominoes so this guy is just pushing a domino and he's not expecting any consequence but lo and behold, the gimel will rectify the imbalance and those dominoes will fall on him as a consequence of his foolishness. Now we see that same idea confirmed by Yeshua in Matthew 12, verse 36, where he said that we will give an account of every idle word or everything that we speak that is not within his will. So that force, even the words that we speak, that we release, there's a consequence of that. And we will have to give an account, which is the consequence of that rectification of the imbalance. And, and that's basically the function of the gimel to make that happen. All right, the next one is this another uh, different view of creation that we already touched on. Trying to attempt to answer the question, what happened between Genesis 1 verse 1 and 1 verse 2. So the absence of Yahweh's hand within his creation turns everything into a state of Hava, which is empty and void. So Yahweh's hand need to be placed back or returned back into his creation to release that spark of creation. We touched on this when we did the study on the letter Yod, where it's the smallest letter that's got a very large effect. A little small spark can start a, a massive fire. And that's specifically the function of the letter Yod, the smallest letter, and that ignites the three powers of his spirit, depicted by the Hay, Shin, and the Gimel. Now the Hay, um, when we look at this, I place the Hay in the middle, which I think it's the most important letter um, in regards to Yahweh's spirit. The reason for that is because the Hay is connected to words, it's connected to commandments, it's connected to the mind of the Father, or his will, or his desire. And it's also releasing the medium of words. So when Yahweh created, he released the power of the hay by saying, let there be light. And it was so. So everything he created, he spoke. And he spoke his will through the power of words or commandments that's depicted by the letter hay. That's why I think the hay is in the middle or the most important one, directly connecting to the Father and his will. Now the shin is on the right, and the reason I put that there, because that's found in verse 2, Genesis 1 verse 2, where the spirit of Yahweh moved over the face of the water and the waters of the deep. Now the, the spirit or the fire has the ability to separate. 
Now we read when uh, Yahweh uh, created the heavens, he separated the waters below from the waters above. And that's basically when you heat up water, mayim, you add the fire, which is shin, you get shamahim, which is heavens. That gives us the idea of splitting the elements, taking something that exists, splitting in two parts that are now opposite. So if you take a magnet and you break the magnet, automatically those two parts push each other away. So when you separate something, they automatically separate into this world of duality. So the function of the shin is to create every single force or energy of duality that create this Bereshit effect, the space of duality where we exist in. So it's the power of the shin where that needs to happen. And that power flows from the spiritual to create the physical. So that's the potential to perform work because within a north and a south pole, work can be performed. Within a positive and a negative charge, work can be performed. Within darkness and light, work can be performed. Within hot and cold, work can be performed. So the Shin created all the potential energies to perform work. So where does the Gimel come in? Now the Gimel is on the left. That is the one that is performing the work. This is the camel that carries the electrons from the one side to the other. That's the one that carries the heat from the hot side to the cold side, the light to the darkness, the one that performs the work. So the Gimel is the one in the left or the physical that make everything possible that the Shin and the hay put in place. Now I've illustrated this idea in the form of an example. Now those who don't know um, electricity, this is a very basic circuit. So what we have, the green is the little battery, which is the source, uh, not the green, the battery is at the bottom, which has got the potential difference of positive and negative, which is created by the shin, that duality that's formed. Then we have a switch that switch things on and off. We have wires, and then we have a light bulb. Now, the idea of this circuit came from a designer's mind. We can call this the design brief. So what the designer wanted in this idea was to create light in a room, and the owner of the room need to have the ability to switch the light on and off. So we had to have a some technology called a light bulb, a technology called a switch, and technology called a battery. Now those technologies are created by the, the concept of the shin. The ideas come from the concept of the hay, which comes from the mind of the designer. Now the shin separated the, the, the metals to create the battery. Um, and then it separated the, the, the metal from other metals to create copper wire. And that's also created to create the switch. So the Shin created the technologies that made this design possible. And of course the light bulb, when you separate the materials to create the resistive wire, you need to separate oxygen from the environment, otherwise that wire will burn itself up. But within a vacuum, it will just uh, create light. So for separating constantly metals and, and oxygen and all of that, all these technologies made the battery, the switch and the light bulb and the wires possible. Now switching on the circuit, that's where the gimel come into play. Now the gimel are basically the electrons flowing through the technologies created by the shin through the idea that's expressed through the hay. So we see that only through the combination of the three, we can create light. And verse three said, said let there be light. So without the shin and the hay, light cannot be possible. And without the electrons of the gimel, that circuit cannot produce any light. So we have to have all these things into place in order to create this creation. So when Yahweh said, let there be light, all these things had to be thought of, and that's what we discussed previously in the idea or the first stage of planning, which is called Bereshit in the beginning, where the beginning of time or the beginning of a surface and the end or a beginning of 
uh, a destination and a beginning and an end point, whatever the beginning and the end was, in order to create every aspect of the space called the bed, in order to have this world of duality. Now the gimel is the th third aspect of the spirit that make every movement, any spiritual energy, any cause and effect, any blessing and curse, anything possible that pertains to physical or spiritual energies that flow, that sustain life. The gimel makes that possible. So, and the function of the gimel is released through the yod, and the yod is giving the spark of life to hava, to fill that emptiness and voidness into an idea um, to switch that on and to fill that desire within that creative space. So taking on from this idea into the six days of creation, as I said initially, um, verse one basically created everything. Then Yahweh removed his hand. And then um, through the first uh, uh, expression of let there be light in verse three, is now switching on every single circuit in order to refine it and perfect it in order to have this fullness of this creation done after day six and then he rested. So the perfection of his creation is done through all these ideas and concepts which come from his mind through the expression of his spirit. And what I want to emphasize in the study is that the Gimel, the Shin and Hay are the three attributes of his spirit that make creation and restoration possible. And without the shin and the hay and the gimel, which are the three attributes of his spirit, creation cannot uh, uh, be made possible and cannot be sustained. So all those forces need to be there initially to create, but they also need to be there to sustain his creation. And that applies to us on a spiritual level as well. We need all three aspects of his spirit in our lives to recreate us, to change us from that little valve to the nun sufit or the crown valve, that mature state, so that we can be carried back into the house and become one with him. And the concept of the covenant made this idea possible, which is linked to the marriage covenant, which is linked to restoring us back to the father, carrying us back on the camel's back, from Egypt back to the promised land so we can become a chad or one with the father. Just like Adam and Chava become one flesh when they get married with our marriage, the, the, the bride of Messiah, with Yeshua the Messiah, we become one flesh with him again in a echad or elevated state, which is the ultimate creation. And that will be then day seven from 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 that uh, uh, pattern, so that is basically all I have tonight in regards to the gimel. I hope that um, uh, stimulated your thoughts a bit around uh, around creation. Uh, it was surely a blessing to myself in discovering all these things in relating to creation specifically, and um, just exploring a bit more about Yahweh's word and how the mechanisms work within creation and that might answer some of these questions that is not written down um, specifically in scripture. So it's always a blessing in discovering um, a bit more insight, delving a bit deeper within the Hebrew language. So if there's any questions or comments, uh, I don't know if you're... Um, I've, I've live streamed this on Facebook on Asafim Torahs for everyone. So if anybody have any questions, you can uh, maybe comment there or even uh, I think through yeah. Zoom, you can also add some uh, questions uh, if you want to type any questions. Um, you're welcome and I will attempt to answer that. All right. Uh, a radio astronomer I heard talk believes that sound is more fundamental than light. As photons pop out of sound waves and energy, this fits with Genesis and let there be light. 
we also discovered the same idea when we looked at the, the two letters, uh, Kuf and Lamet, Kol. And Kol can also be expressed as Kal. And Kol and Kal means light and sound. So light and sound is connected by the two Hebrew letters just by changing the vowel points. So they basically cannot be removed from one another. So scientifically, um, sound and light, or light is just a higher frequency or form of sound. Sound is just a slow down um, energy of the sound waves, if you like. And there's even people who, who point a, a, a telescope at stars and then slow down the light and then you can listen to the star and it makes a sound or like a, 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 a music frequency. Um, so that's very interesting. Definitely. Um, also King David in Psalm said he spoke and it was so. Yeah, that's the power of words. And knowing that sound and light is related and light connects back to the spiritual because that's where light originally comes from, we basically don't really give enough emphasis to the power of words in that regard. So everything we say has an effect and has a cause and will have an, a consequence. And that's why Yeshua said you will give an account of every idle word so everything we say and words will never stop existing. They will just exist and keep on existing. So whatever you said will always be there. It's like having a, a, a Facebook uh, uh, imprint that will always be there. Um, technology will record everything you've done in the same way. Every word that you speak will exist forever and will have an effect. And then matter and energy are interchangeable. So energy gives rise to matter and matter gives uh, rise to energy. Yeah, the, the basic example of uh, having ice as a solid and you melt it and you elevate um, the medium to a higher medium, which is a liquid. And then when you add more energy, it turns to a gas and it evaporates. So you can translate something from a solid form or physical into a, uh, a, a vapor, which is linking to the spiritual. And I think that's what sacrifices were all about. It's about translating the gift, which is the animal, from a physical state to a spiritual state through the means of fire and that elevation, which is also the, the mayim and shamahim concept, adding the shin, which is the fire, to mayim, which is water, creating the heavens, which is Shamahim. And the fire is the vehicle of translating anything physical to spiritual. And it's also the means of purifying us, transferring anything that's physical into spiritual or elevating us to a higher state, so to speak, through the working of our spirit, uh, which is his refining fire working within us through difficult situations. But like we saw with the study, is that the gimel represents the spirit that gives us the ability to carry a load through very difficult situations and circumstances. So it doesn't matter how difficult the situation is or how challenging the challenge is, his spirit expressed through the gimel will help you to overcome so that you can be refined through that process and have a witness at the end of the day on how Yahweh carried you through. Any other comments or questions? Um, Condundrum for scientists. Matter can neither be created nor destroyed and energy can neither be created nor destroyed. Yet how uh, was matter and energy created if they are both and cannot be created or destroyed through the word of Yahweh. Yeah, so that's a conundrum for them. Um, just uh, studying science, we see that you can't create anything from nothing. And yet they state the Big Bang, that something existed out of nothing, which more or less line up with the word of Yahweh, which is verse 3, which says, let there be light. That's the closest thing we can get to the Big Bang. 
which is Yahweh's influence into setting everything into activation to create something from nothing. And yet they say he does not exist. And yet they believe in the Big Bang, which you need a lot of faith for. Oh, there's another comment. Um, the removal of the hand of Yahweh, given uh, in 1 verse 2, caused chaos, would also be reason why we have chaos in this world, as we have removed his hand from us. Yes, that's a very valid statement. Um, we ignore his existence, therefore we basically push his hand outside of our existence, therefore removing his spirit from our world and then leaving us with Hava, which is chaos and darkness and voidness. And that's why there's so much chaos in this world, because we refuse to acknowledge him. But we, as his followers, have the means to carry his name. By carrying that yod, that spark, in our lives, we're basically taking the chaos where you are, adding his yod, creating yote vafe in your sphere of influence and where you exist. So we carry his name by expressing his yod or his spirit through our lives and then bringing order in the world of chaos. So we have to express his spirit in order to restore um, order and to create his creation or to, to replace that spark of creation back into the chaos so that his name can be elevated and seen in, in this dark world. Shabbat Shalom and uh, thank you very much for joining. I wish you all a lovely Shabbat and be blessed. Hope to see you on the 11th. Um, Shabbat Shalom.